The Lighthouse will be available to youth all around the world Friday nights 9pm. Despite the current social climate, we are adamant on providing youth around the world with spiritual content that is enlightening, thought-provoking and entertaining. First and foremost, we'd like to thank God for allowing us to be here and for providing us with this platform to allow His light to shine throughout the world during this dark time. Also, we'd like to extend our thoughts and prayers to all those who are struggling through this time of uncertainty, and we pray that the Lord may provide you with all His comfort and His peace. But before we begin with tonight's show, we thought it'd be fitting to introduce the Lighthouse uh, briefly. A lighthouse being a tower or building or other type of structure designed to emit a great light from a system of lamps and lenses to serve as a navigational aid for pilots and captains as they pass through dark waters. It is fitting for this show to be called Lighthouse considering the overwhelming dark scenes that surround us today. We pray that this show will navigate each and every single one of us as we pass through the dark waters every day. Wherever you are, we ask that you join us in these hymns. We will then be graced by one of our beloved Father, Father Mark Basili, who will continue our current youth series and give us a word of wisdom regarding one of, one of the Lord's final words on the cross, I thirst. Finally, let's never forget Christ's words to his disciples in the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We hope that you all enjoy our show. Whether you are at work or at home, whether you are alone or with others, we pray that you are the Lord's lighthouse to the world. Enjoy. Hello everyone and welcome to our coronavirus special uh, youth meeting. Thank you so much guys for having me. Um, Yes, yeah, so as, as mentioned, we're going to be speaking about uh, one of the final words from Christ on the cross, um, specifically, I thirst. Um, any person that is dying um, and their final words are always cherished. Uh, people will always come close to a dying person to hear what it is they have to say. Um, the most cherished word that a person will speak is his or her dying words. And so when Christ speaks his dying words, the whole church bends her ears towards Christ, towards the cross, to hear what it is that Christ is saying in, in his final moments. And for that reason, Christ's final words on the cross have always been um, of tremendous importance and significance to us and, and to the church. Um, it's as though Christ erects a pulpit from the cross and he speaks from the pulpit of the cross. Um, and we as a church gather around this pulpit to hear what it is that Christ is saying to us. And if you look at all, all of Christ's words on the cross, you find that they're all giving words. Uh, you know, when you're suffering, you'll often think about yourself. You think about your own pain. You don't have energy to think of somebody else when you're suffering. Uh, but for Christ, of course, this is different. In his final moments, when he is suffering, the only thing running through his mind is others. For instance, he says of the, of the soldiers, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So he has the strength to think of others and also those who have hurt him to ask for their forgiveness. He says to the right-hand thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. Again, thinking of somebody else. Uh, he says to his mother, Woman, behold your son. So giving her the gift of somebody to look after her. He says to John, behold your mother. He's thinking of John and how John can look after his mother, thinking of his mother Mary. But then it comes to, to his comment saying, I thirst. Now that would at first glance seem like he, he was thinking of himself now. He's saying that, all right, now it's my turn. I'm, I'm thirsty now. So what, what is going on behind these words of, I thirst. Um, it's actually a fulfillment, first of all, in a prophecy, Psalm 22, which is a prophetic psalm. Psalm 22 says this, My mouth is dried up like a pot shred. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You ever wonder what a pot shred is? A pot shred is actually a fragment, a clay fragment of an old pot that's broken to pieces and discovered an archaeological site. 
So if you imagine something that is so dry, it would be clay discovered in an archaeological site. That's a pot shred. And so Psalm 22 is saying of Christ that my mouth is dried up like a pot shred. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. All moisture has been sucked out. What a mystery that Christ, who is God, creator of the universe, creator of the oceans and water and rain, the one who, when the Israelites were in the desert, they have no water, so he, can, he makes water come out of a rock. The source of all of that water now is hung on upon a cross with no moisture in his mouth. Yeah. And so he cries out saying that, I thirst. Now, th there is two levels to this. That of course, at a practical level, and at a human level, Christ, who is fully human, is thirsty. Um, but what is going on beyond this um, is he really thinking of himself at this moment or is he thinking of something beyond that? Um, one interesting connection to make um, that it seems St. John is deliberately making. St. John, his, his gospel is broken up into seven signs. And each of these signs are a significant miracle or an encounter that takes place. And these uh, encounters or miracles are pointing towards... Uh, its completion at the cross. And there is links between each of his signs. Now, if we compare what's taking place here at the cross with his encounter with the Samaritan woman, um, you find St. John creates deliberate connections between the encounter with the Samaritan woman and between the events that take place on the cross. For instance, he refers to both of them as taking place at the sixth hour. At the sixth hour, he goes to the well to meet this mad woman. At the sixth hour, he is crucified. At the well with the Samaritan woman, his disciples had left him because they were hungry. At the cross, his disciples have left him out of fear. At the well, he look, turns to the woman and says, Give me a drink. I'm thirsty. I've walked a long distance. At the cross, he's hung and he says that I thirst. And so there is this deliberate connection taking place. But what's interesting with the Samaritan woman is that she actually doesn't give him a drink. He tells her, I, th I thirst, can I have a drink? And her response is, you know, who are you, a Jew, asking me, a woman, for a drink? Like... She doesn't actually give him a drink. Um, but what does he say to her? He says to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And so it wasn't him receiving the drink from the woman. It was Christ giving the woman a drink. Not any drink, but water that comes and springs up into everlasting life. Water that he promised will make her never thirst again. Um, and so in a sense, he thirsted that, that afternoon, but his greater thirst was to give her water. That was his thirst. He wanted to see her have this living water. You want to see her move away from these men that had been with her and left her and, and find the true bridegroom. He wanted to see her return and repent. And it was that thirst that Christ had at the will. And it is that thirst that Christ has at the cross. In Zechariah, there is a prophecy in chapter 12 that says this, And I will pour on the house of David and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanliness. It is a prophecy that, that was spoken of in the book of Zechariah that the day will take place when they will look on the one whom they pierced, 
which of course is Christ. Nobody else was pierced. And they, in that day, when they look upon him who is pierced, in that day, the fountain shall be opened and all will be given to drink. Um, and that is the thirst that Christ thirsted for. The thirst to give us living water. The thirst to see us repent. That's what he is thirsty for. St. Gregory of Nazianzen says this, God thirsts that he may be thirsted for by people. He wants people to thirst for him. That's his thirst. And St. Isaac the Syrian says, Thirst for Christ that he may intoxicate you with his love. The unfortunate ending to Christ's thirst was that vinegar was given to him. The creator of the universe, who created water, could not even receive water in his last moments. But vinegar was given to him to add insult to injury. This is actually in our hands. Because if we are saying here and today that Christ is thirsting for you, Christ is thirsting for your repentance, then our response is either to quench his thirst or to give him vinegar. Yeah, and that's in our hands. When I offer Christ my repentance, I'm quenching his thirst. When I offer him my rejection and my sin, I offer him vinegar. Yeah. And so, in these days, we pray that we would somehow, throughout our life, quench the thirst that Christ has for each and every one of us. Yeah. We thank Abuna so much for that lovely talk. Um, we just have a few questions for Abuna that have been sent in. And if you don't mind, I'll yeah, ask those. Um, so the first one we have is, why do you think the Lord uses the theme of water and thirst? Obviously, like you mentioned with the Samaritan woman, he promised her the living water. Um, and then now he's kept that motive going with, I thirst. So why do you think that's a constant theme for us? Yeah, yeah there was once a, a soldier who said, um, was wounded in battle. And uh, he had been shot, uh, wounded, in, in, the, in the heat of, of frontline battle. And his comment after was, in, in that moment when I was in the heat of the battle, wounded, um, explosions going on around me, the only thing I could think of was that I was thirsty. Yeah. It, 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 it trumps any anguish, any pain. Even a bullet wound um, can't be felt when you're thirsty. Yeah. So it's, it's such... Uh, a strong a feeling and desire. So when Christ is presented to us on the cross and he is in agony with the thorns and the crucifixion, it is the thirst that he's feeling the most. But as we said today, it's the thirst for each and every one of us that we would return to him. But of course, water has a very powerful symbolism throughout Scripture. Um, of course, it is always, whenever we speak of water, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Um, and there is the waters of baptism. And in, in Genesis chapter 1, where we have the Spirit hovering over the face of the waters. Um, and this theme of the work of the Holy Spirit is often symbolized through water. And that's why water is used in baptism. Um, and St. John picks up this theme of water throughout his, actually, his signs, not just in, with the Samaritan woman, that the well um, has this theme of water, but also he links it to the cross where Christ thirsts, and also his side is open and what runs out? Blood and water. Um, in the wedding of Cana of Galilee, it's also a connection because what happens when there is no wine is Mother Mary orders that the servants do what Christ says, and Christ says, okay, get me water, and they bring jugs of water. Um, and that then is used. And so there is this connection of water that takes place throughout Scripture. Yeah. Um, so we'll come back to the questions later. Now we're just going to cut to a wonderful skit made by the youth called The Avengers.
now some of the Please. questions. Hi guys, welcome back. We're just going to ask Abuna some of the questions that you've submitted for us and feel free to submit any more that you have. So Abuna, we've got a question here. Um, how can I thirst for God? I pray, but are there any other practical ways that I can increase my thirst for Christ? Yeah. Look, I think um, this is a good question, but I think it's nice to start where we spoke about today. And that is to realize uh, there is somebody thirsting for us. Um, you know, when you ask kids, and I ask kids a lot this question, uh, do you love Jesus? And many of them will say yes. And then I'll say, why? Why do you love Jesus? And they often respond with, because he loved me. Yeah. He loved me first, so I love him. Um, and I think that's a good place to start. And I think there's great, there's great um, depth in what children say, that when somebody is, is reaching out to us, when somebody is loving us, when somebody is thirsting for us, that's the place to start. So my, my part is actually just a response. And it's an experience. There is the beautiful verse that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Once you taste and experience Christ in your life, the thirst develops because you've tasted and you've seen that the Lord is good. So, so begin with, with Christ's thirst for us, and ours is simply a response. Um, and that response, when tasted, we taste and see that the Lord is good, we will develop that, that thirst for Him. Mm. Beautiful. Um, another question we have, Abuna. Um, what are some practical ways we can keep our thirst for Christ alive during isolation? Yes, this is a good question, uh, considering the, the times that we're living in now with, with the coronavirus that's spreading um, around the world. And um, we've seen that the vast majority of countries around the globe are now uh, in putting people in isolation, asking people to stay home and not to go out and, and to, to self-isolate, social distancing, keeping... Are we, are we all right? <laughs> um, don't want to get arrested here. So. <laughs> Uh, keeping keeping distance, uh, so on and so forth, um, and so it is. It is isolating us from everybody. Um, and one of the the, the greatest um, sadness in all of this is is churches are closed, uh, pl the place that brings us together uh, as a body of Christ uh, is now closed, um, and so more than ever we're being isolated and, and pushed away. Um, However, I think it's important that in everything that takes place in our life, we should always look at it positively and look for the opportunities that it presents. Yeah? Um, I'll read to you what C.S. Lewis wrote in 1942. Um, he said this. He said, Satan says, I will cause anxiety, fear and panic. I will shut down businesses, schools, places of worship and sports events, and I will cause economic turmoil. Jesus responds, I will bring together neighbors, restore the family unit. I'll bring dinner back to the kitchen table. I'll help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. I'll teach my children to rely on me and not the world. I'll teach my children to trust me and not their money and material resources. Yeah. This is horrible what's happening in the world. It's, it's absolute disastrous to see people sick and dying, uh, the economy crashing, people losing their jobs and their livelihood, uh, the anxiety that's, that's, that's on the rise. Um, it's, it's, it's horrible, it's heartbreaking. Uh, but we need to look at the opportunities that it presents. Yeah. Um, the idea of slowing down, the idea of spending time with our families, um, the idea of spending time in quietness with Christ, with prayer, with reading of Scripture, the opportunity that is presented with service, when, when, when the whole world is, is hoarding and trying to look after the, their own self, we as Christians ought to step up and shine. We will show love, we will show service, selflessness. It's an opportunity that has presented itself to humanity. Uh, we need to take up that opportunity. And so in this time that of self-isolation, um, maybe we can reword it. Not self-isolation, but retreat. 
it's a time of spiritual retreat. Yeah? Um, and if we look at it that way, I, I, I believe that we will begin to come closer to God. We will thirst for Him more. And we will, we will repent more and we will seek to live our Christian lives in a better way. Yeah? So I would encourage everybody, and myself included, that we take this opportunity that has come upon the world, that I use it for its, its good and that I be at peace. There will be an end to the coronavirus. There will be life on the other side of coronavirus. Uh, but this opportunity that we have to be in retreat, um, and service is, is a once-off. Let's take it. Yeah. Um, we have another question here. So, um, Abuna, you mentioned that um, the devil has said that he will bring all of these things about and that he'll do all of these things. A lot of people are out there questioning if God is upset or angry at the world and this is his way of trying to reel us back in. What's your opinion or what's your judgment on that kind mm. of thing? Yeah. Look, I think theologically speaking, I think it's good to clarify that God is a good God, only capable of goodness to humanity. He's not a, a vengeful, angry God to get revenge upon the, the wickedness of mankind. Yeah. It's, it's not in his nature. He's a good, loving God. That's who he is. Once you know who God is, you know, that's not how he acts. That's not how he functions. But because he's a good God, he will use everything for good. And so sickness and evil take place in this world, not because God brings it upon the earth, but because evil exists in this world. And we live in a fallen world, in a fallen nature, where there is sickness, where there is corruption where all these things take place and can thrive. God does not bring it about, but rather He uses that as an opportunity, as it says here, that doesn't matter. I'll bring people together. I'll let people focus on their families. I'll let them stay home. I'll shut the pubs and the clubs. Yeah? Brothels closed. Massage parlors closed. It's now time to, to, to look at what's important. Yeah? So He'll use it as an opportunity to, to wake us up a little bit. Look what's happening. The, the, the money that you trusted in is gone overnight. The businesses that you invested your life in, I'll take it away in a second. It can all go. And so it, it's, it's God's opportunity to make us to look more deeply at our life um, and, and, the, and the kingdom that we are, we are heading for. So to answer your question, no, God does not bring this upon the earth, but rather God will use it as an opportunity to, to freshen us up a little bit. Yeah. Another question is, I don't want the time in isolation where we can wholly focus on Christ to be in vain. How do I keep my thirst alive after this period passes? Yeah. Look, I think, if, I think Cyril, if we can um, really take advantage of this time that we have, then we will come out differently on the other side. Mm. You know? And um, one, one way that's been put before um, is that every tribulation in life, every crisis, every problem that we encounter in our life, presents us to a fork in the road of life. Yeah. We're traveling along the road of life, and we've had a pretty smooth run, you know, our generation. We haven't seen wars, we haven't seen pandemics sweep through the globe. We've had a, we haven't seen economic disaster take place. We, we do, we've had a, a pretty smooth run. And here we are in 2020, where a crisis, a pandemic hits the globe. Um, this presents us with a fork in the road of life. We've been traveling along and here we are at a fork. And the fork is that we grow better or we grow bitter. Yeah. And, and if, I, if I can use this time, uh, not of self-isolation, but of retreat, where I grow better in my relationship with my family. I grow better in my relationship with God. I grow better in my service to humanity then I'll come out on the other end, a different place than when I began. Yeah? Rather than becoming bitter at what's taking place and how can God allow this. Yeah. And bitter that I'm stuck with my family all day long and I can't hack them. And, and bitter that I can't find toilet paper, I'm going to go smash someone to get some toilet paper. 
Yeah? I become an angry person with full of anxiety. I'll come out in, not in the right shape. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, so take the opportunities to grow better, better, better. I, um, just yesterday, I was opening my letterbox and there's a letter in my letterbox. Um, and it was a letter from one of my neighbors uh, down the road. And, um, and he wrote in this letter, Hey guys who live on this street, um, it's me from number one. And um, we don't really know each other. We always just wave at each other as we, as we pop out of our houses or drive past. Um, but maybe now is the chance that we get to know each other. Mm. We're all stuck in our homes. Um, and we can be here for each other. Even if you just need a toilet paper roll, we can share toilet paper. Mm. Whatever it is, we are here for each other. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and he concluded the letter with, God bless. And so I saw that and said, what, what a beautiful thing that comes out of, out of a disaster where neighbors start talking to each other, you know, asking each other for help. Yeah. So to, to, to benefit from it, take the, the right approach to each of these things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. So we are going to cut to now to a hymn. Um, thank you so much, Abuna, for answering all those questions, and thank you for all those who sent through those questions. Welcome back, guys. Thank you for all your questions. We have time for two more. So, um, Abuna, there's a question here that says, it's easy during this time to think of ourselves. How do we have the same love that Christ had to others on the cross in his deepest pain? Yeah. You know, I think it's, you're right. In, in a sense, it's, it's almost natural that we, we think of ourselves first. Um, but I believe it's actually a discovery when we think of others. Because it's almost like a paradox that in thinking and caring for others, uh, we find joy and we find fulfillment. Um, and Christ said that he who seeks to save his own life will lose it. But he who loses his life for the sake of others will find it. Um, so it's a paradox. And, and that's, that's what Christianity is all about. Christianity is a paradox. It hardly makes sense. Um, when you look at what Christianity teaches, a lot of it doesn't make sense. Love your enemies. That doesn't even make any logical sense at all. How can you love them if they're your enemy? Um, but because Christianity doesn't make sense, that's why, that's the greatest evidence of its truth, because it makes no sense. Um, and part of that is this, this discovery, this, this paradoxical discovery, that when I care and when I serve others, I find in my own life joy and fulfillment. And so I would just encourage you to try it out. I, I do it in my own life. If, if I'm upset one day, I know what to do. I'll go out that night and I'll do some sort of service. I'll go visit somebody, I'll ask about somebody, just any service. I'll come back happy. Yeah? That's, that's, that's how, we, how we were made. Why? Because we are created in the image of God. And, and, and God's nature is a selfless one who gives of himself for the sake of another. There's this beautiful story that's come out of Italy at the moment of a Catholic priest who uh, died because of the coronavirus because he gave up his life support to another person who was younger than him. Um, and that is Christianity, where you, you, you lose yourself for the sake of another. It doesn't need to be that extreme, um, but it can be in the sense of time, that I lose my own time for the sake of another person. Yeah. We advertised in our church just last week. We, we announced saying that we're doing a service to do some shopping for the elderly. And if you want to help out with uh, delivering shopping to the elderly, um, put your hand up for it. And a and hundred people put their hand up for this service. And every day I receive a shopping list from somebody. I drop it into this WhatsApp group of these hundred people. And within seconds, someone snatches it. I'll do that one. I'll take this person. No, I'll do that. And they're fighting over who can serve the elderly. That's Christianity, um, and it's just a discovery. Uh, try it out. Try it out. Serve people. Give of yourself. In your, when you're in pain, think of others, and you'll find that it's the greatest fulfillment in life. Awesome.
Awesome. Thank you, Warren. Uh, we actually have another question on the line. I'm hoping it's a bit more of a question than the last <laughs> one. Uh, thank you, David. You with us, David? Well, um, in body, it's so nice that we um, that we can see you. Um, so thank you so much for this. Um, the question I wanted to ask you, Father Mark, was that you mentioned that um, we need to understand that that the Lord's first for us. But and sorry, I've heard that like it's important for us to understand that. And that changes our perspective when we understand that God really cares for us personally or thirsts for us personally. But how about if I can't feel that? If I don't feel that he thirsts for me personally? Thank you. Thank you, David, for the question. Um, I'll ask you a question back, Dave. I know you can't answer me back, but I'll ask you a question <laughs> back anyway. Um, when Christ is on the cross... What, what was he, who was he thinking of? Yeah. What was running through his mind when, when Christ is on the cross? Um, from his final words, you can tell that he was thinking of others. But, but at a deeper analysis, you will realize that Christ was actually thinking of each one of us. Yeah. And so imagine that God crucified had you in mind. That ought to uh, make us realize the extent of his love for us. Imagine when, um, when you first found love. 22 years old and you're a girl and this older guy comes along, he's charming, tall, sweet, and he tells the girl, I really like you. Oh. Imagine the feeling this girl has. Oh. He's thinking of me. Me? Oh. Swept off her feet. Yeah? Just because the guy thought of her. In the same sense that God is thinking of us. And he's thinking of us at, at, at the most crucial time of his crucifixion. God thinking of me, that ought to create a response. A response that I'm loved. And that if I'm loved, uh, that I'm worth something significant. And I give my life back to Him. St. John the Beloved had this really beautiful title that he gave himself. We all in, in, on, on earth give ourselves title. Like, I'm Father. Father Mark. you know, Or I am... Dr. Mina, um, or I'm Professor Watson. We, we give ourselves these titles, and if we can't find one, we'll, we'll revert back to Mr. or Mrs. or whatever it is. Like We have titles. St. John the Beloved gave himself the title Beloved. Like We didn't give him that title. The church didn't say, this is St. John, let's call him the Beloved. He called himself the Beloved. That I am the Beloved Disciple. I am the disciple whom Jesus loved the most. Of course, we know Jesus didn't love anybody differently. But he felt God's love the most to the extent that he thought he was the most loved. He was the beloved. And that's St. John's um, greatest spiritual accomplishment, that he felt he was the greatest loved amongst the disciples. One church father said, just place your head close to the chest of Christ, which is what St. John did. He, he lent his head on the chest of Christ in the Last Supper. You'll see in the icons. St. One of the Church Fathers says, just place your head like John close to the chest of Christ and you will hear the heart that beats with love for you. And you will feel his love. Place yourself close to him and you will feel his love and it will inspire within you a response. Yeah. And that's the response that Christ thirsts for. Thanks, David. So we have one last question for you, Buna. Um, we talked about the fact that 
Christ thirsts for us? How can we encourage others along with ourselves to try and quench Christ's thirst? Yeah, yeah look, I, I think this is um, a beautiful question and that, that really hits to the heart of uh, mission and evangelism um, and encouraging people to develop this love and this response to Christ. It's not just something that I appreciate and enjoy, but that I would share it with others. Um, and again, I would say this coronavirus pandemic presents an opportunity where people are really afraid and are really anxious. Um, and things that people relied on have been snatched away from them overnight. Yeah. Um, these are the, are the moments when we can begin to think a bit more deeply about our life, about what's important, about what's the purpose of all of this. Yeah. And being a priest, I, I walk in the streets looking like this. Um, in Australia, it doesn't really flow with fashion here. Maybe in other countries it blends in, whereas in Australia it doesn't really blend in. And so people look at, look at, look at me a lot. I'm used to, I don't mind. I just smile, it's okay. But I've noticed a big change. That when I walk in the street pre-coronavirus, it's, it's a look of, well, whatever. Church, priest, it's not a big deal. But, you know, outdated, archaic. Why is he wearing that? Who believes in God these days anyway? Yeah. But now, I feel like when I walk in the street, people look at priests differently. There's, there's this look in their eye of, of maybe there's something in that. W would you pray for me? Um, is there a God out there who's looking out for us? You know? And people come and talk and ask for prayers. And so it is an opportunity in, during this time to be bold. And to speak about Christ, to reassure people that there is a God who loves them, is looking after them, yeah? and that this earth is not the, the all, the, everything we're living for. There is something beyond this. This is a kingdom that we are excited for, yeah? and, and we can use this as an opportunity to, to really discover that. So take the chances that we have now to speak boldly. Yeah. So on, Catherine, uh, on Catherine's behalf and myself, we'd like to thank Abuna Mark very much for coming in today and and joining us on this on this journey, getting to know a little bit more about Christ's final sayings. Uh, we'd also like to thank everyone at home for joining us today for today's installment of Lighthouse. And we hope that you can join us next week and hopefully on time at 9pm next week on Friday for the next installment of Lighthouse. Thank you so much. <laughs>